What I'd like to do today is to discuss the controversy which has been going on for the last 40 years regarding the site on coastal Connecticut. And the way I would like to present this is to suggest a set of null hypotheses based on history and archaeology of the site, as well as the archaeobotanical research that we've done in addition to astroarchaeology and metrology of uh, selected features, as well as the geoarchaeology, which most recently has to do with the OSL dating that has been conducted by NERA, in order to draw some preliminary conclusions regarding the question. The Gunji Womp is located in Groton, Connecticut. It has access to the Atlantic Ocean, as well as inland through the Thames River, which runs north and south, parallels the Connecticut River, which runs all the way up into Vermont. The controversy has to do with chamber sites and other stone features, as well as petroglyphs, which can be found at the Gunji Womp site. The state archaeologists back in the uh, 1980s came out to conduct some of the first evaluations, recorded seeing no evidence of anything other than 1700s occupation. And the archaeological research that has been done at the site from the 1980s to date has certainly documented the fact that there were English colonists. The earliest point, for example, was 1742 from the reign of George II, right through the Revolutionary War period. In addition to that, was ceramics and so forth that were excavated by the Gunjiwamp Society in the 1980s and 90s that matched the dates of these coins. It's clear that they're also from land records that go back to the late 1600s, that most of the features that we see are from the early American and colonial period. In addition to that, there is at least one rock shelter which produced the lithic in the slide, the oldest of which is the Susquehanna Broad, which goes back to the transitional archaic roughly 3,000 years ago. So it's clear that at this site, which recently has become a transfer to the state of Connecticut as a state park, encompasses the archaeological record, which is well understood uh, for this part of the world. The question is, there are some artifacts and features which do not fit conveniently into either Native American or English colonial provenience. We have a discussion about how do we account for these features, and that will be the uh, subject for the talk. We have the judgment by former state archaeologists that there's no evidence to contradict the hypothesis that these are all colonial early American sites. And we have, according to the former uh, Vermont state archaeologist, at least regarding uh, stone chambers, we have no archaeological or ethnological evidence that these stone chambers were of Native American origin. The conventional interpretation of these stone chambers, as we find at the Gunjawap, and in fact all throughout New England, is that these were colonial root dwellers. But there is another possibility, and that is that there was a pre-English colonial European occupation which may be responsible for the construction of at least some of the structures. Without going into too much about the philosophy of science, we would like to point out that the only methodological way that we can make these kinds of distinctions is through the use of null hypotheses, which have to do with avoiding a tautology, of which there are two examples here. One of them is that if you have similar structures, that in and of itself doesn't help you differentiate when they were built. If you have identical construction, that's not what we need. What we need, rather, is something different. What we need is to have a statement that can be categorically done. For example, um, if you have a total absence of archaeological evidence at a site, which would be European but pre-1600, that would be evidence that, in fact, there were no pre-colonial Europeans. The same goes for the second statement, or the number four here, that the stone chambers are not mentioned in an early document. And surely Europeans, when English as they arrived, would have made a record of that. So these are both statements in order to come up with our null hypotheses. So let's see how we might approach that. And to date, we've looked at uh, historical records and indigenous oral traditions. We've looked at archaeology and the metrology. We've looked at the astroarchaeology or the alignments of uh, windows and doorways that reflected pieces. 
And in the future, uh, we'll be looking at archaeobotany on a, analysis and uh, ongoing uh, geoarchaeology for dating. The historical record is interesting. We have the, as early as the 6th century, we have an account of voyaging across the North Atlantic by early Christian hermits or monks. The record, which is probably the best known, is the Navigatio St. Brendan, which records a voyage into the uh, North Atlantic. We also have records of the North, and they arrived in Iceland in 874, where they record that they, the Papas, or the, the Christian uh, monks, had preceded them to Iceland, and that the they had left behind their books, their bells, and their crosiers when the pagan Norse arrived. In Norse, the Celtic uh, monks, or the, all, actually all of the peoples who lived in Ireland, we're called Vestman because Ireland is the furthest island west from, from Europe. Even today in Iceland, you have Vestmani Eyer. Well, Eyer in the Norse is it's an island. Vestman is an Irish Irishman or the, the man who lives in the west. Across from where Vestmani Eyer is, Selfoss, which I'll talk about in a minute, but before I would point out to you, that Iceland or Island is the only island that has a Patrick's Fjord. Not an Olaf's fjord, it's a Patrick's fjord. And this word pape, another island off the south coast, comes from the Norse for papa, meaning a monks. And Iceland at Seljafoss um, has a cave church and is filled with Latin crosses. The scholar who's done the most work on this is Aaron Christensen. And when I visited the site 20 years ago, I noticed that at the entrance of the cave church, there is a Cairo that has been carved in. This is the Greek Chi. This is like a Latin X and or a Latin P. This is Chi and this is Rho. And these, of course, are the, the acronym that you see even today in Catholic churches or in Orthodox churches for Christos. So these are clearly Christian symbols. What's important here is that in the historical records in the time of the great exploration by Britain in competition with the Portuguese and the Spanish and the French at the end of the 16th century, this Navigatio of St. Brendan is referenced as one of the justifications for the uh, British territorial claims to North America. So historically, we've got a, a record or a series of records for English or British occupation of what becomes the American colonies. Interestingly, as early as 1651 in Connecticut, we have a record where iron is uh, 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 to be searched for at Pequot. Well, Pequot was the initial plantation, which is modern New London. The Gungiwamp site is across the river from New London and Groton. And in fact, at the Gungiwamp site, we have iron ore deposits, which were apparently discovered because we have evidence of mining operations there in the form of slag, which is found in the local stream bed. Three years after the permission was given by the Hartford Court to explore for iron, we have a letter written from Springfield by John uh, Winston to uh, John Winston II, who was the founder of the Pequot Plantation. And it says, Sir, I hear a report of a stone wall and stone fort uh, made all of stone which is newly discovered at or near Pequot. I should be glad to know the truth of it from yourself, there being many strange reports about it. It becomes now an open question of, of who was responsible for building these. In 1654, we have the letter being written. The question is, is it related to the first Anglo-Dutch War? Is it something that was created by the indigenous Pequots and Mohegans? Well, one of the answers is that wooden palisaded forts were well known and documented among indigenous peoples, as were wooden palisaded forts by Europeans. But a stone fort and stone walls is not. And the other possibility, of course, is that the stone wall and fort that are being mentioned here may have another explanation, which is neither Native American nor English colonial. For example, the Mohegan oral tradition talks about Makiwis, or the little people who live in small underground house or beehive-shaped timber rocks. They are not Mohegan people but they are people who live apart from them. They make gifts of quartz crystals, painted skins or herbs to the Mohegan. They introduce some new uh, plants to the Mohegan. What's interesting is when we look at the what is known about Native American, or in this case specifically about Mohegan 
and Algonquian uh, folk medicine. There was a book written by Gladys uh, Tantequidgen, who's Mohegan. And she, in fact, lists 35 medicinal plants that were used traditionally by Mohegan people. And three of those are introduced from Europe. So one of the questions is, when were they introduced? Was it after 1600 or before 1600? This is an archaeobotanical question that we can try to test for. If, for example, we have sites that, through flotation, if we can retrieve botanical remains of any of these three plants and date them, then we can answer the question of the date of introduction. In any event, all of this possibilities for uh, North Atlantic navigation uh, in the 6th century is going to depend upon the archaeological evidence. Well, to date, we have four pieces of evidence that raise the question about pre-colonial provenience. And the first is a rotary mill race with a carbon-14 underneath it that was uh, dated from excavation and floated charcoal by Jim Whittle back in the 1980s came back with the date of AD 556, plus or minus 100 years. There's also the possibility of early Christian uh, petroglyphs, like the Cairo and the uh, so-called IC ball symbol. There's also winter solstice and equinox orientation in the stone chamber at the Ganshawab. And the last is that the chamber that has the solar orientations is a Pythagorean triple. So let's go through each of these quickly. Rotary edge runner millstones date from uh, Roman times, medieval times, right up until in Connecticut until 1935. Here's an example of one of them in operation. At the Gunjiwam, in fact, there's a unfinished millstone that was started to be worked, but it hasn't been separated from the bedrock underneath it. It's already been rounded out and squared off on the, on the edges. We have another example from the Gunjiwap. It's from the Adams house, the base of a uh, horizontal rubbery handle stone. We have examples here from Ireland and Scotland to show that this is an old traditional way of grinding. This is clearly a European construct, but the question again is we don't have a good way to, to date it directly. It's currently sitting at, at UConn in the collection of the state archaeologists. What's interesting about the mill race, which is found probably 50 meters away from where the that rotary dual base of a horizontal mill was, the trough or the race that a wheel would be rotated around fixed on an axle underneath to grind perhaps anything from oak bark for use for tanning operations or for even, uh, you know, apples, presumably, if you needed to make apple cider. And what's interesting about the dating for this mill race is that there was charcoal retrieved from underneath the outer ring, which dated to 556 AD for an average date. We hope to be able to come up with an OSL date from this same feature to see if they overlap with the charcoal. The other feature that is found at the Gunjiwamp site includes Kairos. Again, the Cairo symbol is introduced in Britain in the 4th century under Constantine. It appears on Roman coinage after the time of Constantine the Great. It appears, these are all from Britain. The style of this middle one is the one that we see where you have a slight diagonal with only one piece on the chi, not a complete chi with two diagonals. And this is a, as far as I have been able to determine, a uniquely Romano-British style of Cairo. There are a number of different variations on this Cairo theme. These are all from England before 500 AD. This one here we see at the Gunjiwamp. This one over here we will see up in, Verm in an example from Vermont. The ones at the Gunjiwamp, in fact, there's more than one. There's at least two that are complete. This is an example of one. In the liturgy of the Christian church, there are two high holy days. Uh, one is Easter and one is Christmas. These are the most universal and probably most important. They commemorate the birth and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, these dates were memorialized in early Christian architecture and in the cathedrals all during the Middle Ages, for example. The most common orientation for Irish early Christian monastic oratories or chapels is the equinox sunrise. And this is based on a survey that I did uh, 20 years ago of early Christian oratories in Ireland and Scotland, the Orkney Islands, and in the Shetlands. 
The actual date for Easter changes year to year because it follows the same rule as Passover. That is to say, it's the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the uh, Constantine uh, wanted throughout the empire, the Christian state for Easter to be the same. And so the rule was adopted that it will be the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox. The Irish church was never part of the Roman Empire, and they continued to follow the Passover rule. So the, the Easter day didn't fall on Sunday. It could be any day of the week. What was important is it was the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So the vernal equinox for everybody is begins what we call the paschal cycle or the Easter cycle. And that's the reason it is commemorated with alignments. The other solar calendric mechanism has to do with the sundial. And under the rule of Benedict, you have the hours of prayer. And the, and the five hours are calculated as follows. At the time of the equinox, for example, you have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of nighttime. So the sunrise is the zero hour. And if you count forward to 9 a.m., it's the third hour. And noon is again the sixth hour. And at 3 p.m., it's the ninth hour. And at sunset, it's the 12th. What's interesting or what's important here is the 3 p.m. or nones or the ninth hour. Uh, and the reason for that has to do with the crucifixion of Christ, because that's when Christ gives up the ghost. In Ireland, you have, here's an example of an equinox aligned on an oratory. This is the famous Galarus Oratory. Here you have, instead of at the ninth hour, you actually have it at nine in the morning or at the third hour. But my point is that the Christ figure, which is in the Irish tradition referred to as Christus Solveros, meaning Christ, the true son. The sun symbol becomes a metaphor for Christ as seen here in the book of Kells in the window of the oratory, which is oriented to the sunrise on the, at the equinox. At the Gunjuwamp, we have a similar situation where you have light entering a diagonal window shining into a side chamber to the side and this is an equinox alignment not only is it diagonally and horizontal but it's a diagonal on the vertical now this metaphor for the light having to do with Jesus starts to get interesting when you realize that in addition to this equinox event the other time that the side chamber receives light is at the time of the winter solstice, that is to say at Christmas, where you have the left door jam at Christmas and the right door jam at the equinox. So the vernal equinox is really what's important here. And the time that it happens here for the winter solstice or Christmas alignment, it's at sunrise. And here at the vernal equinox, it's at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Well, 3 p.m. was the ninth hour. So you start to see a pattern emerge here that the light itself and the architecture, either by coincidence or by design, coincide with the birth and the death of Jesus. That is to say, you have a sundial to tell you the time and the day for the correspond to Christmas and to the beginning of the Easter cycle. You can't have a date because the Easter is different than the than Christmas in terms of its timing. It's a lunar solar event, whereas Christmas is a solar event. But you have the closest possible way of recording this in architecture that can be done. And again, you have in Revelations, we read, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. Well, both the Alpha and the Omega have been memorialized in architecture at this particular site. And it's at ninth hour or 3 p.m. when the light disappears inside that chamber that coincidentally or, or by design corresponds to the death of Jesus. So another feature of the Irish monastic oratory architecture is that they are all quadrilateral. The monks would live in circular stone dwellings, but the church itself would always, or iglesia would always be rectangular or square. For example, you have the quadrilateral floor plan at Peter's Temple or Temple of Fediar in Lewis Island in Scotland. It's laid out as a 5, 12, 13 Pythagorean triple ratio. In fact, it's, it's within two centimeters of being five Egyptian royal cubits by 12 by 13. 
So when we compare, for example, Vermont stone chambers that were recorded and measured by Ed Giovanni Neudorfer in her book in 1980, you can go through and determine which of these are Pythagorean triples. And what you start to see is immediately that some of them are and a few of them were not. But all the ones that are being listed here are, again, within two centimeters of being Pythagorean triples. And in fact, there are examples from Ireland that are listed over here in this last column to the right that match patterns that are found in Scotland and in Ireland that corresponding to the ones that were found in Vermont. There are many others. In fact, more of the, most of the ones in, in Vermont do not correspond to these Pythagorean triple patterns, but the ones that you're seeing on the screen do. So, for example, at the Gunjuwamp, chamber number one, this is the one that has the solar alignments we talked about. You have also a 5, 12, 13 ratio laid out in the, in the floor plan. This is the window where the sun comes in in the equinox. This is the doorway where the sun hits the left door jam at a winter solstice sunrise. So the preliminary result so far is that we have calibrated uh, carbon-14 dates in the 6th century. We have got Hiberno-Latin sacred names or nomina sacra iconography in the form of these petroglyphs. And we have solar-oriented oratory architecture matching that to be found in the British Isles. So the next step was to investigate further if we can find confirmation in the New World, in the New England, of other sites that by looking at their architecture, iconography, et cetera. And to summarize quickly where we are, we look at chamber number 32 up in Vermont. Here we see a two to one ratio corresponding to integers in, um, that are that are uh, in Justinian, Byzantine, Stepithani, or you can consider those as cubits, but Stepithani is what the Greek word is for it. Again, this is only significant if we can find other integer ratios in the same unit of measurement on both sides of the Atlantic. If we have two or three or four or five that are to be found in the old world as well as in New England, then we can say that this is no longer a coincidence. In terms of the astronomy at chamber 32, this is what's really kind of interesting. It's the same targets on the same day as what we see at chamber one at the Gunjiwamp. That is to say, on the right-hand side, we see the sun entering the major axis of the, of the chamber, illuminating uh, what looks to be or could be an altar site at, at the end of the chamber on the winter solstice. And over here, more interestingly, there's a window in the back it's not really a chimney. There's not an evidence of fire or soot or carbon deposition that you would expect to see with a chimney site. Instead, what you have is a rectangular, a large rectangular opening where sunlight comes in on the equinox. And at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, it hits a spot on the wall, which corresponds to a piece of rock art. And the rock art looks to be a dark the pigment is possibly charcoal, possibly manganese. If it's either of those two, it, that means we can date the inscription because both the manganese and the carbon are datable. What's interesting also is this chamber is all limestone, and that means that the groundwater over the years has continued to deposit limestone over the rock art, so it's preserved it. And again, it's at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., that this light will disappear, just as it does at chamber one in the Gunjiwamp. In addition to that, there's a the rock art that disappear or that the light disappears on is similar to the symbol here, which is a Cairo. This example actually is on a pewter bowl that was found in London dating from the early Christian period. And in the next slide, we will superimpose the symbol. This is from the pewter bowl. This is the symbol enlarged now that was hit by the light. And when you take this Cairo symbol and you superimpose it, you see that it, it's a reasonable match to the symbol on the left. That's why we want to be able to date this pigment to see if it, it comes up with a date that is consistent with the Irish monastic interpretation. In addition to the rock art that's done with pigment, in the same chamber are petroglyphs. And these were published by Barry Fell back in well, 1976 is when this was first noticed or recorded. And it's an inscription with Alpha and Omega and Chi and Rho. And here's the Cairo here in the cruciform with a single mark, just like similar to the one that we saw in the cave in Itzelio in Iceland. 
and the word antron here meaning cave in uh, Greek. At the same site in Vermont, there was a photograph by Warren Dexter back in the 1986, another Cairo with a circular sun symbol on it, which is similar to uh, this example on the right from County Antrim in Northern Ireland. The next question is geoarchaeology. OSL dating, as we saw, can help us by dating the sediment or rock when the last time it saw daylight. In answer to the earlier question about the time spread, Dr. Feathers told us that the rule of thumb for OSL dating is you know within plus and minus 10% or plus and minus one sigma, which works out to be plus and minus 100 years or 10% at 1,000 years prior. So if we're in the year 2000 and we, or we have a date that comes back at 1000 AD, it's plus and minus from the 1000, gives you the date range. And we pick the, the middle, the average or the midpoint or median and say it's 1000, but it really could date as old as 900 AD all the way up to 1100 AD. And as you go back in time, the 10% opens up again. And, and so the further back in time we go, then the wider the unknown for the date range comes. Conversely, the nearer or the younger dates have a smaller date range. That would explain why you see plus and minus 7% versus our spreads versus a 15% spread. The narrower spreads have to do with younger dates and the older uh, dates that you have have a wider uncertainty or wider date range. This site number 32, chamber 32, was one of the ones that was included by in the NERA survey and we're hoping we can get a good sample out of it. Paleoethnobotany tells us that here we have the Vermont site, here we have the Gunjiwamp site, and here are the various European plants that have been introduced to Vermont and to Connecticut from Britain and who are also found on the Faroe Islands and the Iceland and in some cases, Greenland. Here's the same slide that we showed before. These are the three European plants that are included in the folk medicine of the Mohegan peoples. What we really find interesting is that the highest concentration of these European plants is right along the Connecticut River Valley, whereas as you get away from the Connecticut River Valley, it drops off in terms of the percentages. I hear you, 97% of these 16 or so plants, but you go to Wyndham County, which is inland, or as soon as you get away from the river, then the density drops off. These are modern plant populations that have survived or become naturalized, but are European in origin. The other thing we can look at is the hair that may be retrieved by flotation in the archaeology. Because the hair is protein and not calcium, it tends to survive longer than bone does, and it can be linked in theory to other animals that may have been introduced. We have the examples from Faroe Islands using phytoliths from oats and pollen. We have artifacts that are like, like these Celtic rings that are showing up at dates based on the charcoal and carbon dating from the 600s to 650s. Plus, we have the Christian burials that are laid out east to west with the feet in the east, which indicate Christian occupants of these islands at the same time period. So the implications of all of this is that we have archaeological evidence, which is inconsistent with the interpretation that these are colonial European or indeed Native American. There's something else that may have occurred at this particular site, and therefore we should continue to try to uh, resolve the interpretation. And that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thanks very much, Vance. That was great. Um, yeah, we're kind of short on time, but we will take a few questions here. There's one that's about the uh, the word Gunjiwamp. Uh, is it really the Mohegan for little people's houses? And can you give us a reference or a URL uh, that we can uh, see for that? The word Gunjiwamp in Algonquian may mean something like high rocks. The word Makiawisug repeats refers to the little people who lived underground and who provided herbal plants to the Mohegan people. According. Norman Bigart has um, previously promoted the idea that the word Ganjiwam could be from the old Gaelic, meaning church of the people. Do you have any comment on that? That's a true statement. That's his interpretation. Okay. And uh, what about the meaning of the word fort? There's a question here that says, uh, did it mean something different in the at the time where you were quoting it? Not sure which quotation he's referring to. 
that has to do with the strong fort in it that in the John Pynchon letter from 1654. The salient point of that letter is that it's talking about a stone structure, not a wooden structure. That is to say, stone wall and strong fort. So we're looking for a stone structure that has to do with walling and possible fortification as opposed to wooden. And the question is, in the context of the letter, strange reports. Seeing rocks and stone in New England is not strange. There's rocks everywhere. There's piles of rocks. There are glacial erratics. The question is, at this time period of 1654, at the end of the Pequot Wars, when the east side of the Thames River is being explored by English colonists coming in from the west side from the Pequot plantation, presumably looking for iron deposits, which we have archaeological evidence that iron ore was being extracted because we found a slag of the stream beds at the Gunjiwam on what's now state park land. And it's the closest hills to Pequot Plantation. If you go west, the land is flat. When you go east across the Thames River, that's where the iron deposition is found among stony hills, which matches the context of the, of the letter. So to me, a fort is, if it's made out of stone, means stone walls. If other people People have different interpretations, that's fine. I really can't comment on, but to me, it would be some sort of military application, which means a defensive position. Great. Well, that was an excellent talk. Uh, lots of great information there. Thank you very much, Vance.